Arun Excelo Ziva, an elite active retirement community in Mahabalipuram, Chennai. For apartments and luxury villas, call 7288-7288. Namaskar and a very good morning to all of you. To the four ambassadors, the consul general, the deputy permanent representatives, the diplomats, my colleagues, my friends, and to the Indian community, uh, it's really a great pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, as uh, Ambassador Babchi told you, this project took a little while really to be realized and I thought I should go and check up on it myself to see <laughs> whether it's really done. And I'm glad to see it is well done. Now, uh, this morning, we obviously formally dedicated the Chancery uh, and uh, I had the privilege of paying homage to uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, whose statue is just outside this hall. And the naming of this hall of Tahansa Mehta. In a way, I want you to think of all these as reflecting what is also happening at home in India. Meaning, just like we have built a chancery, Modern India is also getting built brick by brick, step by step, building by building. Just as we pay homage to our Dr. Ambedkar here, the cause of social justice, the idea of inclusive growth, of rule of law, is gaining ground and is today very central uh, to the policies and activities of the government. And just as we honor Hansa Mehta, Today in India, the, not just the idea of gender equality or gender justice, but the idea of woman-led development. This was actually our big push when we had the G20 presidency last year. And we were very, really, very, very pleased to see that it was a, uh, it was a strain of thinking that we were able to successfully inculcate into the international community. So I, uh, even as we take satisfaction in the event today, I want to remind you that in a way it's a sort of microcosm of, of what is happening uh, at home. Now, something else happened at home recently. It was called the general election. I think you would have all noticed it. But again, I want you to think about it, that after six decades, a government was elected for a third successive term. That in itself is a statement uh, worth reflecting upon. But what it has done is, on the one hand, it's made us ready to go from day one. Uh, so, so, and I'll, I'll like to share with you some thoughts then, that, uh, uh, you know, initiatives, programs, progress starts uh, really the moment the term of office begins. Two, it's an important moment to look back. You know, if you are beginning a third term, uh, there are lessons, there are achievements, there are even shortcomings from the first two terms. And it's something one needs to objectively look at and learn from it uh, and see really, you know, how, how that can serve for the path ahead. And third, which I'm sure all of you agree, I, I think, you know, when we look at the conduct of our elections, the enormous scale, the very heated arguments, but finally, the very ready acceptance of the results. Because ready acceptance of results apparently is no longer the global norm. <laughs> so, so, you know, we, we, we do say things to each other. There are different points of view. But finally, I think we have as Indians every right to be proud of our democratic exercise, the integrity of it, the, the scale of it, uh, and, and the efficiency of it uh, in many ways. So uh, those were uh, really, in a way, uh, thoughts that I had, you know, I felt I should share with you. I'm also conscious, I'm both today at, uh, you know, in a way, at the center of 
uh, globalization, multilateralism, globalism in a way. Uh, it is it is also something which which uh, uh, obviously uh, you know focuses my thinking today, yeah. and also that I am in Switzerland, you know, a country uh, which has uh, in many ways uh, achieved so much from which where there are there is so much potential in our partnership, and I'd like to say a few words about that as well. Now, let me begin elections over. So what, what was it really about? And what is it really thereafter? Yeah. Now, I would say the conversations that took place during the election and after the election, actually are conversations, what are we capable of? What is holding us back? What is the pathway which we should take? You know, what motivates us? What is the speed really at which we go? You know, how do we particularly address uh, our demographic uh, advantages? How do we create a demographic reality into a demographic dividend? What should be the levels of confidence in the country? You know, and if the confidence is inadequate, what should we do to raise it? How we, you know, everybody would agree we should have growth, but how do we make growth more inclusive? And how do we, in a way, address the challenges of yesterday, today, and tomorrow at the same time? Because the challenges of yesterday are still there because they are so enormous and in many ways they have been incompletely addressed in the past. The new challenges keep coming up every day. But if we keep looking back, only looking back, only looking for the day, we are really not planning for the day ahead and we will constantly remain behind the curve. So really, how do we do all of this? And I think today, particularly the role of technology, what technology has done for governance, for uh, delivery of public services, for ease of living, for ease of business, to create new jobs, uh, I think these are all really part of the conversation uh, today uh, in India. And let me start in a way by that looking back, as I said, you know, uh, for us, we've been 10 years in office. Uh, and uh, when we look back, uh, as I said, there's a lot that has been achieved. Uh, but, uh, you know, these building blocks, uh, the bricks and mortars, which you spoke about for this building, those bricks and mortars are also being put in place in India. And I want to share with you, you know, I can I can speak to say, okay, you know, there's one more minister who says very nice things. So I want to give you some figures because there is a certain exactitude, a certain, you know, accuracy, even a certain belief which comes uh, out of figures. And I've tried in a way to take different sectors in the last 10 years and try to reduce it to some figures. So let me share about seven or eight of these figures with you. And of course, you know, you know the overarching figure is, okay, in these 10 years, our GDP doubled. But look at the bricks and mortars, okay. Our high-speed road corridors in these 10 years have increased by 8x. That from 550 kilometers today, they are 4,300 kilometers. If you look at the metros in the country, 10 years ago, there were six metros, there are 21 now, there were 550 kilometers, uh, sorry, there were 250 kilometers then, there are 950 kilometers now. If you look at the port handling, it's almost doubled in this period. Airports, and many of you would travel to India, actually airports have doubled in this decade. And when you say airports have doubled in this decade, that means you're actually on average building seven to eight new airports a year. Okay. I just came from Germany, but they're very proud that they built an airport in Bali. It took them, I think, four years or something. So I mentioned this because these are indicative of really the speed uh, of the changes. You know, uh, we speak about, and, and it's something which every one of us relates to. You know, most, you know, people like me, people like my colleagues here, we all live abroad, we go back to India. And what has been our refrain for so many years, you know, is, oh, it was so nice there, we come back here, and what am I going through? Now you're going through a country where 28 kilometers of new highways are being built every day. 
where 12 to 14 kilometers of rail track are being laid every day. So if you look, and I'm not even talking Vande Bharat and the better quality of trains. So I want to share with you this sense that, look, the bricks and mortars part, the infrastructure, something which has held us back, which every one of you has personally experienced, that is changing. But changing that is not enough because at the end of the day, you know, countries, societies are about people. So how are the people changing? Now, the people changing is particularly important because, you know, we are a young country. I mean, we are today on median age, uh, about at least 10 years younger than almost every other major economy in the world. And in fact, uh, in the next uh, 20 years, 25 years, actually the, the gap will grow. We will be even 15 years younger than most major economies. So what have we done in terms of human resources? you know, what lies in a way ahead of us. And it's again important to look here at achievements. Achievements not to satiate, but to motivate. Not to say I've done well, aha, so I'm done. But to say I've done well and I could have done so much more. And if I could have done this in two terms, how much more can I do in a third? So the, I, I can tell you the the uh, intent today is actually to speed it up, to ramp it up, to increase it, to keep telling ourselves that what we have done is just a beginning. I mean, there is no intention of resting on whatever models they may be. And I again want to talk to you about it because I must tell you, you know, when I travel around the world, and you would have noticed I do a fair deal of that, uh, you know, most of my counterpart, most of the presidents and prime ministers are made. Uh, yes, we do the foreign policy bit, that's the professional uh, part of it. But they are enormously interested actually in what is happening in India. I have to, and uh, you, you know, it will amuse you. Sometimes the conversation, even the words, are very similar. You know, I had. Uh, the leader of a very major Arab country actually say, you know, we have food distribution system and Ms. Minister, you don't know how much leakage we have. You know, the, the word leakage immediately resonated from him because he was very interested how do we today manage the the food support, the, you know, the Anni uh, where, you know, today they are covering 830 million people. How do we manage that with actually much less leakage than there's ever been in the past? Or people who ask today, how have you uh, improved your income tax collection? Because, you know, every president and prime minister is interested in increasing the revenues. So we, again, when we, when I look back at these 10 years, yes, there have been changes for the good in our country. But I also say to all of you that those changes actually globally resonate that other countries today look with deep interest. They may not be able to exactly copy it, but somewhere in what we are doing, there are lessons for the rest of the world. And if people feel this country, which bear in mind, which is still at $3,000 per capita income, or below that, is able to do that much, you know, we really need to look at what they are doing. And again, let me give you some numbers because I feel numbers in a way are a better uh, sort of indication of progress. I mean, all of us do it in our daily lives and in our professions. Uh, if you take, you know, medical colleges in India, and again, all of us want good doctors, as many doctors around us as possible. They've actually increased when, in 2014, there were 387, there are 706 today. If you look at all India Medical Institutes, which many of us are familiar with, we go to it in India, they've actually tripled from 7 to 22 in the same period. In fact, the number of students, the you know, people going for PG and MBBS degrees have doubled in this period. The higher secondary schools have grown by 60%. And if you look today, and schools with computers, uh, which was about a quarter of the total schools in India 10 years ago or today almost half. And, you know, since we were talking about Hansa Mehta, 
Today, if you look at school enrollments in India, for the first time, more girls are enrolled than boys. In fact, if you look uh, at even higher education, the number of girls, the females in higher education has gone up by 32% in this period. So I'm, I'm sharing with you this, and you know, everything, I said medical, the same thing holds through for technical, that, you know, you actually have pretty much, if you look at the education and skills sector, whatever was the baseline of 2014, I make this as a broad proposition, in the last 10 years has actually got doubled. Now, if we could do that doubling in 10 years, and with that as a base and all the experience, of course you can see, that, you know, the coming term, when we say, okay, we are heading towards Vixit Bharat Developed India, we have today the confidence, uh, the experience uh, to, to really uh, do very much better than that. So, and, you know, and uh, again, I've sort of given you one part of the story, the institution building, the, the hard infrastructure. I've given you the human resources side. But, all of us also know uh, in many ways that we are a country still uh, where poverty is a very big challenge. Again, we have made progress in this period, 250 people, million people have come out of uh, poverty, but it's not enough to come out of poverty. We have, you know, what is regarded as the daily necessities of life, that itself should go up. The baseline needs to go up if we have to go up as a society. And what you are actually seeing in India, I don't know if you have given thought to it. You often hear about programs, you know, you would read that the number of, say, uh, prenatal programs have increased. After birth, the nutrition for mother and child has improved. The health facilities at basic levels have improved. What I want to tell you is that every level today, from pre-birth to post-job, there are interventions. I mean, we just had a decision last week that people over 70 would get free health care. So that's that extreme of it. At the, you know, if you start from nutrition to, you know, cleanliness to uh, basic health, primary health, to education, to retention of students in school, to skilling, and each one of these, it's again not a slogan, it is not a good intention, it is not, you know, a poster sticker that you announce on Independence Day and say, okay, I've, I made that declaration. Every one of these today has a figure, has a number, you know, we can tell you it has this many people who benefit from it. You know, when, when COVID, uh, hit all of us. Uh, one of our very early cabinet meetings on COVID, uh, the Prime Minister actually asked us all to read up on the Spanish flu before we sat down for that meeting and reminded us, he said, you know, more people died of starvation in the uh, Spanish flu than they actually died of the flu. And that was something we could not uh, allow, you know, uh, it to happen again. So, uh, we, we actually started a food, a nutrition and a food access program, which has since become permanent. Now, there are other countries, you know, people, even in developed countries, people give food stamps. There are uh, ways of, uh, of uh, supporting uh, the weaker, vulnerable sections. But we ourselves must uh, understand today that this is a country which is taking care of 830 million people, their food requirements day after day. And just think cumulatively what it will do to the health and nutrition and the physical well-being and all the capabilities which will come out of that. We are all aware of the Ujwala program, the firewood. I mean, to, to burn firewood in an enclosed building is almost medieval. I mean, other than the, the health implication. Now, look at the scale, you know, to replace for a hundred million homes, firewood burning with gas cylinders. I mean, look at the enormity of it. So, the, the, if you see many of these schemes, 
uh, again, uh, it's, it's, we expect in developed countries. I mean, I, I was just a few days ago in Singapore and, you know, Singapore is one of those countries where development and housing, housing was a very integral part of the evolution of Singapore. The idea today of having a house as a basic right, that is a big jump for us. And yet it is a jump which is happening. I mean, if you look at the last 10 years, at the rate of 4.8 individuals, a family, which is our average size, 160 million people are living in homes that they did not have 10 years ago. So these numbers which I'm giving you, I mean, these are the populations of countries, sometimes of continents. And that's the kind of change today which we have shown ourselves capable of unleashing. And if we can do that today, I mean, think of the possibilities that await us and think of the, you know, really of the starting point today as we begin our third time, it is so much really better than uh, where it was before. Now, uh, as I said, you know, uh, because it's a third term, we were ready to go. And uh, already, I think, some of the big initiatives tell you something about where we think uh, we should be and where, how we relate to the world. Uh, we have announced 12 major industrial zones across the country, which we hope that we build these industrial parks uh, with, in, you know, if, if necessary, with a collaboration of uh, international uh, partners and use this really to attract global manufacturing uh, to the country. Second, a very major skills initiative skills not just as what would the government do in terms of skill centers that would be the obvious one but really try to include private sector try to include global business try to use internships and support systems of various kinds to actually make the working population much more capable and uh, employable third of course keep improving the logistics because i gave you some numbers but you know the numbers look good because they are on an earlier base, which was very much lower. But now with the new base, we need better numbers and we need to keep those numbers going. So more ports, more railway lines, more roads. And in many cases, we are actually, you know, correcting historical, uh, I would say, shortcomings. I mean, if you look at the western coast of India, there are virtually no deep water ports along the entire western coast. Now, Considering that so much of our shipping today goes out to the Gulf and uh, to the Western world, it is something which is a crime need and yet it was something which is not addressed for so long. But now there are plans today to really develop a whole uh, port network uh, centered particularly along the port called Vadhavan. Uh, oh, as I said, think for tomorrow. So, we are today looking at, say, I'm giving you as an example, semiconductors. That if you see the importance today of semiconductors to the global economy and all the associated industries that come from it, there are obviously, there are business implications, there are skill and employment implications, but there are very deep technology implications. That if we are to go ahead, we need to build those deep strengths and semiconductors again, you know, uh, we, we started something in the 1980s. We stopped in the 1980s. Some of the institutions which were last done were done probably at the time of Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi. And then it stopped there. They didn't take it forward. So the, the, uh, the point I make is we are today looking ahead, looking at our present situation, trying to correct you know, what we have inherited, the shortcomings we inherited. And we can see the world is responding. You know, one of the interesting uh, uh, revelations, you would read about something called the glo of Global Capability Centers. Today you have close to about 2,000, somewhere 1,800, 1,900 global uh, capability centers established by international business in India. And they are actually generating exports probably to the tune of about $150 billion. Because the world today realizes India is a great production base. Now we have to make it better. It won't happen by itself. I mean, 
we have to create, we have to make it easier to do business, which we are trying. We, are trying, we have to, uh, you know, reduce the levels of bureaucracy. We have to improve the logistics. We have to create that platform because business, we have to compete in the world really for business. And that is something, uh, you know, which we are seeing. Now, some of you would be thinking, you know, maybe there's a mistake, maybe, you know, why is the foreign minister talking about all these things? <laughs> this, none of this sounds like foreign policy. And I'll tell you why. Because at the end of the day, when you go out in the world, what does the world look at? Would they look at your capabilities? If your capabilities are not strong, the best English doesn't compensate for it. <laughs> And they look at confidence. And that confidence comes from capability. They look at, in a way, at your calculations. That judgment, the relationships you have, how you look at the world, how do you assess it, how do you calculate with whom you are, what is the quality of your relationship. These are actually factors on how foreign policy is decided. So for me, every brick and every mortar, every better equipped person in India, you know, everybody with better health, better roof, better condition of life, and therefore a greater ability to contribute, is actually part of the cards I hold in my hand when I go out of India and deal with other countries. So for me, all that happens at home is, is actually the basis on which foreign policy is conducted. Now, as I said, you know, uh, it requires hard work. It doesn't happen in a day. I mean, we are struggling with some issues. If there's a big debate in this country, in our country about manufacturing. Now, the fact is, I mean, there are people who would say, why are we importing so much from China? Part of it is because we neglected manufacturing through the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and maybe even the first decade of 2000. When, I mean, think back, I mean, all of you uh, are as connected and have as good a memory about our country as I do. When did we actually have governments who made a major push on manufacturing? And yet, there are people who today come and say, no, we need to find a fix, as though it's something you can do instantaneously. In fact, and there are other way, people who actually also say that we are incapable of it. We should not even attempt it. So, now, ask yourself, can you actually be a major power in the world without manufacturing? Because a major power needs technology. Nobody can develop technology without developing manufacturing. But yet, you have that strain of thought also. So, as I said, you know, it's, it requires, until we develop the human resources, it requires hard work. Until you build the infrastructure, until you have those policies. So life is not khata khat. <laughs> life is hard work. Life is diligence. Anybody who's held a job and labored at it knows it. So that's my message to you, that we have to work hard at it. But I'm also conscious, I'm in Geneva, <laughs> and I need to say a few things about uh, what's happening here. And uh, 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 as, as Ambassador said, uh, I've, uh, you know, last day uh, met a number of uh, heads of international organizations. So, I want to share a few thoughts uh, about what happens in Geneva, how do we relate to it, what are the conversations, what are our interests. Thank you. So, now this could be a talk in itself. So, I limited myself to uh, three or four uh, bottle, uh, uh, to three or four uh, issues. So let me start with human rights. It's a very big subject in this city, rightly so. 
human rights should be debated. After all, everything I have been talking to you is about human rights. But you know, when it comes to human rights, uh, India is actually a very unique society. And I'll tell you why. Because if you look at the history of the world, with the exception of India, maybe somebody else, I'd be open to that suggestion. But I would say probably with the exception of India, every other society has put an enormous emphasis on uniformity. When people think of a country, they think of one language, they think of one faith, they think of one ethnicity. Homogeneity is supposed to be about nationhood. This is universal. Even countries who have a range of people, a range of languages, actually impose that larger uniformity construct on their entire society. I don't have to give you any names. Just look at the map of the world, look at big countries and you get the answer. We are the only people who have not done it. And I tell you, that's the first and most basic human right. We have allowed encouraged, facilitated, accepted people with diversity to continue in that diversity. So my point when I look at human rights is to try to politely and hopefully convincingly tell people, you know what, I'm actually in a much better starting point than any of you. Because you actually have suppressed or distorted or underplayed much of the diversities and divergences and pluralisms in your society. I have that. Now, because I have that, I would also have the accompaniment. I would have the argumentation. I would have, you know, the debates in my society. Others may have less, but they have less because actually they have suppressed it or they have eliminated it. When I have divergences, pluralism and diversity, uh, the, you know, the conversations in that society will necessarily be different from those societies which don't have and never value that kind of divergence. The second, of course, is that a lot of the conversations on human rights are built, uh, I would say, you know, um, these are, in a way, you can say post-predatory conversations that after you've dealt with the whole world for centuries, now you can come back to Geneva and give lectures to them. <laughs> but it is, you know, it is something we need to look at because I think it's important to get our narrative out, to have our message out. If we, you know, are underconfident or if we start actually running down our own country in public, we're not going to have those conversations. Because if you start running down your country in public, 192 other countries will join you in running down your country as well. And international relations diplomacy is competitive. So I do feel that, you know, it's, look, we are a democracy. We are a 1.4 billion people plus. There will be flaws. There will be shortcomings. There will be mistakes. There will be things which, you know, somebody can reasonably object. That is part of our growth and part of our learning. But it should not become a kind of a, a tactic, a kind of gamesmanship to put India on the back. And that is what sometimes we see. So when it comes to human rights, where there is an honest conversation, we're always open to it. But when you know you get down to these rankings and uh, ratings and so on, those are not honest conversations. Those are mind games, which are actually played out for a political purpose. The second uh, uh, domain which I spent some time talking about was uh, health. Uh, and again, you know, we have tried uh, really uh, to uh, to expand our health coverage. Uh, you know, we have this program called Ayushman Bharat. Now, in the years, I mean, it's not been there for long, but 
again you have to visit India and particularly non-big city India to understand how much of an impact it has made. Uh, just five years ago, the footballs which we used to get on Ayushman Bharat programs were 135 million. Last year, it was in excess of 1.2 billion. So it's actually grown 10x in the course of the last five years. And I think it will keep growing at that rate, if not more. Health costs are a very major issue to everybody. We actually have created a model where you have stores. There are today, I think, 13,000 stores across India which sell uh, generic medicines at costs which are normally about a quarter or a third of what you would actually get the same medicine in the same city if you go to a normal pharmacist. Now, it's, it's a government's effort at inventory management, at making, uh, you know, something essential, of, you know, affordable and accessible to the people. Now, I mentioned these two because when we have conversations about health in India, I want to tell you that there's a lot of interest today. Just as I told you, somebody is interested, how is there no food leakage or, you know, how is it that your payments are delivered, uh, your loans are given to people. There's a lot of interest, in a sense, it's like a best practices conversation on what's happening on health. And, of course, there is the issue of uh, traditional medicine. Uh, we are very proud uh, that, uh, uh, and uh, also we take it as a responsibility that WHO selected Jamnagar as the center for the uh, Global Traditional Medicine Center. Uh, it is something which, uh, uh, you know, we take seriously. We had our first uh, summit, traditional medicine summit, last year. Uh, and we want to take it forward. A third area is ITU. I think some of you are associated here with it. And, and again, you know, uh, look, look at the telecom sector. Till a few years ago, you look at 2G, 3G, 4G. We were importers of all three. Yet when you put your mind to it, within the space of a few years, we are actually able to come up with a with a 5G stack. You know, it's not a small achievement. Look, look around the world, how many countries actually have created a 5G stack? And, and if you look today at the rollout, uh, you know, uh, we had a telecom conference and both the heads of Nokia and Ericsson were there. I mean, they were frankly, they were staggered at the speed of the 5G rollout today in the country. So, for us again, you know, uh, last year the ITU opened its South Asia area office and innovation center in Delhi. We think it's a very good thing. And this year we are looking forward to hosting the ITU's World Telecommunication Standardization Assembly next month uh, in India. So, why I'm mentioning this is, and, and let me again say a few words about WIPO. Yeah. Uh, again, we have collaborated with WIPO to open 34 technology and innovation support centers in India. We actually hosted the WIPO uh, patent adjudication masterclass uh, in Delhi. So, uh, and, and you know, there is today this big effort, uh, if you look at the patents, uh, numbers coming out of India. Those numbers are actually growing up very sharply because there is very strong government motivation uh, to do that. So I, I mentioned this because this India that I put to you, one where we are honest about our challenges, uh, but we are very determined to address them, where we look at our review at and look and review what we have done. We obviously, uh, you know take satisfaction at what we have achieved, but that serves as a motivation for what we have not yet achieved. And when, you know, in, in all of this, this is an India which wants to engage more with the world. We see the world as a partner who can accelerate development in India, who can help us leapfrog in many areas, because we need to leapfrog. We cannot grow organically, we cannot grow evolutionary. We need those big jumps which will actually catapult us uh, into, into much higher spaces. And there, I want to tell you that Switzerland is actually a very important partner. 
It's an important partner for a variety of reasons. I mean, I think all of you recognize today that Switzerland has a certain standing and credibility in the global uh, community. I mean, people associate it with certain, you know, there is a rigor and a, and a ethic uh, and a standard uh, with which uh, Swiss uh, industry and Swiss practices are associated. So we were very happy when we could actually conclude before the election and FTA with the grouping of countries of which Switzerland was a part. Uh, it was in some senses a very unique uh, FTA because uh, it actually offered, it committed to investment in India and to job creation in India which is normally not done in FTAs. But when we look today at, you know, the industries, uh, especially of the future, when we look at, you know, what, for example, the pharma, the medical industry holds for us, when we look at clean and green technologies, uh, when we look even at logistics, there is a lot. And, and you know, one other area I must say, which, I mean, which is so obvious when you come to this country, when we look at tourism, that there is a great desire today to build tourism in India. We handle the entire G20 with a view to get foreigners, you know, for us, the people who came to the G20 were probably the most powerful 100,000 influencers of the world. When they traveled across India, as they did to about 100 cities, you know, they presented a picture to India of the world and we now need to leverage that and see how we can, in, in, you know, increase international tourism in the country. So there is a lot for us uh, to gain from international cooperation. I think Switzerland is an exa uh, excellent example. This is something that I hope to be discussing later this evening. So these were some of the thoughts uh, I thought I would take the opportunity to share with you. I really appreciate your coming here today, the support that you're extending uh, to the mission, uh, the, the fact that, you know, uh, for us, uh, particularly uh, in, you know, the world in many ways is updating its impressions of India, its image of India. You know, how we behave at home. I mean, if we take the confident, capable, uh, sort of progressive path, that's one kind of image we will present. If we get bogged down in the, you know, divides of the past, that's a different kind of image we will present. Hopefully, they would look at the India which they see the India of the last 10 years, the India of the future. But in all of this, they would judge India by the Indians they meet. You know. uh, finally, all of us, when we think of any country, we put a face to that country. So you are the faces that they will be putting. Uh, so I count on your support, uh, your efforts, your contribution. Once again, I thank you very much for this. Uh, Ian has kindly agreed to take a few questions. If I can have the, have the arrangements in place on the stage quickly, please. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The arrangement is coming somebody from the <laughs> <laughs> Demand, uh, if, if uh, I can get the mic there, please. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, I'm uncomfortable here. Yeah, thanks. Hello, sir. Hello. Okay. Uh, myself, Sanjay. I have uh, one question. Yeah, sure. No, keep it close. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, sir. I have one question or request, which is uh, pending since uh, many years. Uh, as an NRI, I mean, uh, we does not have any facility for uh, voting. And uh, actually, we want to vote for Bright India. The problem is we want to travel also. The, Travel is not an issue, but sometimes the kids' uh, education is stopping us. And uh, if you will address this uh, point on priority when you go back to India, we will appreciate. And I think this is a okay. open look. Got it. What I'd like to do is I'd like to take about three questions at a go. So, ma'am, please. Thank you so much, sir. A very good morning to you. My name is Suha Venkatra, and I actually don't have a question. I have two words for you. Thank you. Thank you for putting India on the map. A new India a modern India, which we are all very proud of. And like you said, you know, we are also a firm India right now. And thank you for being that person who is 
um, you know, who is willing to say it as it is. We are willing to call a spade a spade, and sometimes a garden tool if we need to be diplomatic about it. But thank you for putting that face of yours. We are extremely proud of being up. We said often enough to you, but we want you to know that we are very proud. Thank you so much. My name is Vinay Prasla, retired from UN staff. I would like to ask you a question which media reported a few days ago. This is a completely different kind of question. Recently, some foreign diplomats based in New Delhi had personal meetings with certain opposition leaders in their state. It is not so difficult to imagine what kind of discussion took place. I don't think the Indian government had any knowledge of these secret meetings. I think... What is your question? Whether we have knowledge or not? You see, the main thing is, sir, that I'm creating a discussion to give you my final paragraph. Which is? Coming here now soon. Okay. <laughs> so then, if things come up like this, I think the government should give a green signal to uh, signal before these meetings take place. Now, now comes the question. What is the government view on these these uh, these uh, serious okay. solutions? Okay. Okay. I, 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 I got the gist of it. Just as last, last word. The single solution which could lead uh, to problems for the community and the country. Thank you, sir. All right. One more. Who would like to choose? Hello, uh, thank you once again. It's really an honor to be here. I'm Priyanka Dasgupta from the International Electrotechnical Commission, a sister organization of ITU as well. Um, my question is you talked about looking to the future, and next week, in fact, the New York Climate Action Week, there's also the Summit of the Future. And I know you'll be speaking at the General Assembly as well. So I was interested to learn more about, they'll be speaking there about clever action, sustainable development, digital inclusivity. And are there any priority areas that India is looking to position itself as a leader of or champion? That's my question. Thank you. Okay, let me very, uh, you know, take these questions. Uh, one, one, sorry. Yes. So, no, no, let, let me finish this round. I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, you know, the voting issue, look, we very much uh, understand the desire of Indians who live abroad uh, to participate uh, in the democratic exercise. After all, uh, you know, uh, you too want to contribute or to help shape the direction in which it's going. But here's the problem. Uh, the problem is uh, today there are, I would say, roughly about 20 million citizens of India who live abroad across countries you know we can't we can't say if we extend voting rights that we'll do it in some countries and not some other countries so we'll then have to if you even contemplate I'm putting other issues aside I mean just look even at the logistics of it you really then have to undertake an electoral exercise across 193 or 195 countries of the world and you can see what the challenges of it uh, are. I think what uh, we uh, do try to encourage uh, is for people during that period to come back. Uh, hopefully, as our airlines, I told you, more airports, more aircraft. <laughs> uh, so keep traveling to India. Even my tourism requirement would be done if you bring five Swiss friends along. Uh, but uh, right now, honestly, uh, for uh, say for those who live. If citizens who live abroad, it's a different issue. Those who've taken nationality of other countries, that's a different issue. They will try to use OCI as a via media. I think that's really, in fairness, the, the picture that we have at this time. Uh, on the, you know, people 
uh, diplomats uh, meeting uh, people. Uh, look, uh, I, I would only, uh, you know, uh, say this, that, uh, I mean, in fact, I would make it, in a way, a bigger issue, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, when I say bigger issue, I'm not making it a bigger problem. I'm just uh, giving you the larger principles of it. What happens in many countries is that countries often practice abroad what they're sensitive to at home. So whenever people do any such thing, they must also think about what it would happen if this happened in their own home. You know, it's, it's something they should think about. Uh, so uh, I, I spoke earlier about, you know, even rankings and, you know, comments about politics of other countries. I have no problem if people comment about our politics. But then I think in fairness, they should also be ready to hear my comments about their politics. And believe me, they are very thin skins about that. So, so the, how to get a more mutually respectful world, you know, more equal, more, because everybody says they are equal, they don't actually behave, you know, it's a bit like uh, animal farm, some are more equal than others. Uh, so, how do you actually create that? I think that's also one of the big debates which is uh, today uh, taking place in the world. On the summit of the future, uh, on the summit of the future, uh, yes, I, I mean, to me, there are uh, there are a whole lot of concerns. Uh, one big concern we have is how much sustainable development goal targets have fallen behind and how little attention is really being paid to it. You know, lip service is being paid to it, but practical steps are not being given. And I, I can tell you, you know, uh, I'm, I'm saying this by virtue of my travel. There are still large parts of the world which have been so devastated by the COVID that even today they haven't gone back to pre-COVID levels. That their spending on health, their spending on education, their economies have shrunk. Uh, their confidence is broken in many cases. So what do we do for that post-COVID repair? How do we get the world back on track? I think that's a very big issue. But in terms of what can India do in a way as an exemplar, if I were to pick something today, not just for the summit of the future, but generally, I would actually pick our digital. You know, if there's if there's one thing we've actually been able to demonstrate, you know, when we had the G20, uh, we uh, in the next hall to where the leaders met, we created a kind of a shopping system. But we told everybody, we'll put you know, we'll give you a phone, we'll put money in your wallet. Now you don't pay cash. We want you to use the UPI and do that transaction. And for people, it came as a revelation. You know, when they see, when they see banana sellers on a railing on a street, actually with a QR code, that's when they realize how deep actually the embrace of uh, digitization has been uh, in the country. And uh, I think if you look at the uh, the deployment and the application of, of not just digital technologies, but digital mindset. The people are willing to use that. Uh, I mean, today you don't need a wallet when you leave your home. You need your phone when you leave your home. You look, you know, just look. The, our transactions may sometimes be very small. Look at the volume of that transaction. That, you know, we are generating between 10 to 13 billion uh, fintech transactions a month. I mean, there are countries who don't do a third of it in a year. So, so I do think uh, uh, for the rest of the world, both as an example, as a sharing, uh, as a platform on which other things can happen, it's had a huge difference in governance. I mean, most of you would, would actually be experiencing it without even realizing it, what difference it's made on passports. But if you are able today, to, you know, forget that era where we wrote letters to your RPO to say, are you really you? Please confirm. Uh, that era is not behind. I mean, commissions have a database. If somebody loses something, you know, they check the database, figure it out, and give you an alternate passport. It couldn't have happened without that. And there are many countries which struggle with that even now. Even sometimes developed countries which, uh, you know, so, you know, it's very interesting if you look at digitization. It's not a function of either income or even of capabilities. There is some other factor which is a policy 
a leadership and a policy embrace of digitization as a societal tool and as a governance uh, kind of uh, mechanism. So I would actually focus most of all that. So can I take one more round? Dr. Presenter, my, my name is Saurabh. Uh, pleasure to have you here. There's a headline going on in uh, viral in India, social media since yesterday that Dr. Jay Shankar blushes as the ambassador calls in uh, the staff. I would like to understand among all your peers, or all your foreign ministers, who do you consider the star and why? What would you do? Or strengthen India's relationship with that country and no diplomatically correct answer, please. Honest. Hello. 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 Uh, this side, sir. Uh, hi, I'm a uh, student at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. I have a con uh, question concerning the students uh, here. Uh, generally, we, uh, I acknowledge the fact that the Permanent Mission and Consulate General is taking a lot of initiative to uh, include students in its activities and events, but there's still a uh, long way. Like We don't have uh, the, the permit. Uh, we have a permit issue that we students face after graduating that we cannot work like our counterpart or our uh, colleagues can work easily. So how can the ministry uh, better help in this? I'll, I'll, I'll deflect it to you later. Uh, you had a question, yes. Good evening, sir. Yes. To people in our country, I observed in Switzerland, there is a system, the issue one ticket are all multi-model transport. So if that type of thing is introduced in our country, it will be good for the visitor to visit the areas. That system is available in India. So we are just digitalizing our country, you know. So it will be useful for tourists. It's a good point. Okay, I'll take one. Namaste, sir. Here. So I know my voice is lost. Uh, I thank you very much for all the data that you have presented. And I love data and I'm really proud of the way India is progressing. Uh, but I would like to ask you that I, I maybe I missed, but the data regarding the sexual assault happening in girl, um, girls and women safety was I couldn't hear it from your data. I would like you to I don't want to remind you but you know the number of incidents that are happening in India. It's, uh, there is a movement going on currently all over India and around the world. Currently, <laughs> give me your thoughts why the Justice has articulated medical hospital case is delayed by more than one and a half months. Sure. All time of justice has been given. Thank okay. you. Can I take one more and complete that? Can I speak without a mic, sir? The voice seems clear. I see it which was hijacked to uh, Kandara in 1999. And there's been a movie which got released uh, recent uh, series actually. It's more, what I'm saying is more of a statement and also, if you can uh, comment on that. They've shown me in poor life, but that's a personal story. They've shown the bureaucracy and the people who are dealing with it in very, very poor life and it's been exaggerated. And I, as a proud Indian, feel very strongly about it and uh, um, you could add a comment on something like that. Because I've dealt with uh, people at those levels, Mr. Doble, uh, for instance, and this is just one saying, these are the people I was in regular touch with. And just for your questions. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I, I think this, this is... Uh, so, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm not ducking the question, but I'll tell you in all honesty, what happens is, uh, uh, when you meet other foreign ministers, and I think everybody evaluates everybody, it's very natural. Uh, there are people who've been there for a long time, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, I would say roughly half the world's foreign ministers are people like me, who are diplomats before they became ministers, and about half would be people who had no foreign policy background uh, and became ministers. Uh, when you evaluate people, uh, if you ask me a single, you know, name that one person, uh, I would find it very hard, honestly, to do that because I would see different uh, strengths in different people. There are people very dogged, there are people very skilled, there are people very charming. So 
what happens when you go through life, you, you meet people, you kind of say, you know, okay, I, I must remember that the next time. Oh. So you keep picking up, it's like a self-improvement uh, sort of uh, technique, you can say. So I am in a way ducking your question because, you know, there are 193 foreign ministers, you name one, I've just made 192 enemies. <laughs> I don't think that's a smart move. Uh, but uh, honestly, there is, uh, you know, uh, there, there are, I, I've really learned to, uh, to uh, from, from a lot of my peer group and, and uh, often, you know, like in any business, people sit down and chat and uh, exchange notes. Uh, so that's really the way the, the business works. Uh, on the work permit, I, I honestly don't know. I have the ambassador here. If there is an issue, uh, today, uh, I'll, I'll take a briefing from him. If there is something we need to do with the Swiss government, I promise you, we will. I do want to make one point here today. We are very strongly committed to uh, promoting a global workplace for Indians. Uh, we want mobility and migration to be legal. We want students to be given a chance to work. Uh, this is very much an important part of our foreign policy, uh, not just in Switzerland, across the world, and it is something, you know, we will apply in equal measure in Switzerland as well. Uh, your suggestion uh, on uh, the multimodal ticket, I, I think is a very good suggestion. Uh, you know, there are, look, there are many areas where we are still growing, uh, I mean, sometimes growing the capabilities, the infrastructure, but often looking at other people's best practices. And, you know, uh, it's certainly something which uh, needs to be uh, thought about. I, I would say a country like Switzerland, certainly in tourism, uh, can, be, can be for us a very, very uh, good partner. Uh, regarding the uh, women's safety issue and the, uh, you know, the RG car case, look, I don't think there can be a single person in the country who's not outraged by what happened. And you can see that on the street. Now, the, the fact is, uh, women's safety, crimes against women, is an issue in, in our country. It is, I mean, it may be an issue in other people's countries as well. That doesn't uh, mitigate it uh, in us. So, uh, you know, I'm uh, reminded uh, in a way of something once the Prime Minister said. Uh, he said it from the Red, Red Fort. He said, you... All, I mean, he said, all of us, we give, we say things to our daughters when they go out uh, late at night to ask them things. Do you, hum, you know, do you do that to your sons? So there are, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's really in many ways, it's a, often a specific issue, but there are larger issues. And that is why to me, you know, there are so many aspects to this problem. I mean, it starts with, first of all, the idea of, of uh, you know, respect and equality and, uh, uh, and in a sense, the kind of non-discriminatory uh, opportunities which are given. And I think, you know, uh, to ensuring today the safety and security of women is a, is a very, very big issue. And I don't think, uh, I mean, if you ask people what you think about it, I think there would be a unanimity of opinion. What? Is today, ha you know, happening there? I mean, there are other aspects of it. I don't want to go into anything political outside the country. But, uh, you know, all I can say is, uh, I'm sure like you, you know, everybody in this hall, like me, would have that very deep sense of outrage and anger at what happened uh, to, to that doctor. Uh, on uh, the hijacking issue. You know, I, to be fair, I haven't seen the film, so I don't want to comment. But I'll tell you something interesting, which you may remember. Uh, in 1984, there was a hijacking. Uh, I was a very young officer. I was part of the team which was uh, dealing with it. And uh, uh, a few, midway through the hijacking, I realized, uh, not midway, ab about three, four hours, uh, I actually, those are the days you didn't have cell phones and all that, so, and I had a small, uh, my, my son was, uh, 
a few months old. My wife used to work, so it was my day to go back home and feed my son at lunch. Okay. So I rang up my mother actually to tell her, look, I can't come, there's a hijacking. And then I discovered my father was on the flight. Okay. And uh, it was, the flight ended up in Dubai. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, but I mean, fortunately, nobody got killed, uh, but it could have ended up wrongly. So I know what, you know, uh, and, and it was interesting because on the one hand, I was part of the team which was working on the hijacking. On the other hand, I was part of the family members who were pressing the government on the hijacking. So actually, I had that very unique uh, window into the, uh, you know, on both sides in that sense of, of the problem. So I do understand, you know, often these are situations. And look in movies, you know, movie guys don't make the garments look good, you know, then nobody looks at the movie. You know. the, the hero is supposed to look good, you know, not you. Uh, so, so I think you've got to accept that as, as part for the boss. <laughs> Okay, I'll take a look at it. Shall we? Thank you very much. Thank you. Come on. Thank you again, really. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I wish you a very good day, and uh, I hope to see you the next time I'm here. Thank you.